Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another session we're having for Church Resources Food Service Events in our series that we're developing. So welcome aboard, everybody. Um, today, we're going to obviously be talking about choice, implementing menu and meal strategies in the aged care sector, which is a fantastic, exciting topic. I love talking about choice. So for those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Karen Abbey, Church Resources Food Service Ambassador. I'm also a food service dietitian, uh, have a PhD in the area of residential aged care and spent lots of time looking at what kind of meals were being served around the aged care sector. I'm also a special dietary chef, so I really understand those concepts around how to get meals ready and what to do. I'm also a lecturer at the University of Queensland and I lecture in the area of food services as well and do lots of research in this space as well. So lots going on with me for food services, which I'm very excited to share with everybody. So Esther, can we have the next slide, please? So just some housekeeping. We've got a few more people uh, loading on quickly right now, but just some housekeeping for everybody. Please remember just to keep your microphones on mute would be great. Also, if you could put your cameras off as well, it'd be really helpful. Um, I can actually, and you can see me, I can see you. So if you can take your cameras off, that would be really great as well. We do have loads of time at the end of this presentation to uh, take questions. So if you'd like to put questions into the chat box, feel free to do that. My colleague, Ian Birrell, will be a help um, a mediate and moderate that at the end of this session. So please stick around for those questions. We are recording this event and this will be, uh, which is great. So if anyone has missed out, basically it'll go up on our website. We'll, um, it'll be there in a couple of days and you'll be able to obviously download and listen to it again. There will be a survey at the end, so we'd really appreciate it if you could say, take some time when the survey comes to you um, so that we can actually get some feedback. Really had some great feedback from our last event, so we'd like to continue that. And we're also gonna have some polls, so make sure you've got your mobile phone handy as well. So we're gonna have some interactions. There are four of those in this session. So make sure you've got your um, mobile phones available as well. Thanks, Esther. So as I said, I'm Dr. Karen Abbey. And basically today we have, uh, Esther, do you want to go back one slide? <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, you know me, I'm your host, Dr. Karen Abbey. I also have my colleague Ian Viral with me. He's the category manager for Food Service Solutions. And our guest today, we have Stefan Bland, Food Service and Catering Manager for Pensella Villages, and David Venn from Vesco Foods, who's the National Food Service Business Manager. So you're going to hear from those guys as we move through this presentation. Now, your church resources is very committed uh, to support organisational procurement. This event is part of a series of uh, webinars that we're designing up, and I can already tell you we've got some fairly exciting things for next uh, year. We really want to try and help upskill staff. That's what we're really trying to do and provide those necessary skills for everybody to really do a superb job in food services. So we want to support those that you actually care for and lots of practical solutions and resources. And I'm a very practical dietitian, so I'd like to make sure everybody's got lots of practical things happening. Thanks, Esther. So what are we going to do today? Well, in this exciting uh, webinar all about choice, and I love this area, um, we're going to talk about some aged care standards and choice for consumers. We're going to talk a little bit about some research that's been going on. We're going to talk about what is choice. It's a, it's a bit of a complex topic, actually. There's more to it than I think a lot of us really spend a lot of time thinking about. We're going to talk about the behaviour of choice, why choice is important, building choice on the menu, and quick and easy choice options. So one of the things that we talked about in this webinar for this webinar was actually coming up with some really great solutions that you could actually finish this webinar today, go back to your kitchen and implement just immediately really. And that's what I really wanted to do today was to get those things really happening in aged care homes. So quick and easy choice options. We're going to explore food service choice in aged care. We're going to provide some industry insight, which I think is always important to see the sorts of options that are out there. And again, obviously we want to talk about some of the procurement solutions providing value to your food services from church resources. And also with every webinar, we're trying to put together some uh, resources to actually support uh, what you're actually doing. Thanks, Esther. Okay, now we all know what's happening in the aged care sector. The fact that uh, obviously the aged care standards are very predominantly about consumer choice. And also what's happening is that the expectations that are for aged care homes, even in community meal services, for increased choice, but also those expectations just seems to get higher and higher. 
So it's really important to understand, I think we're dealing with a very different environment now as aged care moves through. You've got more family and friends, their expectations are higher. It is well researched. People can get on Google and basically they can um, find out all sorts of things about your aged care home because every aged care home has a website. People have opinions about what they think the services should actually look like. Um, there's a, a higher level of service expectation, which is really, really important, which is basically happening all the time. And of course, with higher levels of services, there's got to be this, somehow aged care homes have to kind of meet those sorts of expectations. And also there's this expect, expectation around value for money as well. So making decisions based on value for money. And we've heard lots of things about how aged care homes offer extra services or extra bits and pieces in food services or other types of services that are available to residents. And of course, that's all the kinds of, I suppose, additional carrots that aged care homes use to get residents to come and stay with them. Okay, we also have heard lots about consumer-directed care and also things about the funding model as well. Thanks, Esther. So the aged care standards, we all know, the whole eight of them drive towards choice. The choice of consumers, the consumers being engaging, how do you engage consumers, how do staff know, how to do all those sorts of things. And last session, we did a loads around the consumer choice standard 43F and I'm going to touch on a little bit for this presentation as well and that's the standard where meals are provided they are varied of suitable quality and quantity. Now I also delved into choice and sorry into standard one looking at things around choice the consumer's rights to make informed choices how does the organization how does the home actually make that happen how does the home demonstrate how residents can have or the consumer can have lots of independence and make those sorts of choices that affect their quality of life which I think is actually really important. How's the workforce involved in that? How is the organisation management listening? All those sorts of things wrap around this, these new aged care standards. So it's important to really think about how important food services is in the mix and how important really food services I think the crowning jewel in any aged care home and from that you can get lots and lots of people lots of opportunities I think to really improve choice provide choice and lots of strategies that you can actually do that in which I think is really important so next slide thanks Esther so again with the standard 43F I mean some of the some of the statements that you can pull out of that standard around things like how can consumers choose meals snacks and drinks how can consumers take part in the whole process of menu planning what evidence does your aged care home have to actually demonstrate that? And we're going to talk a little bit about that at, towards the end. What can staff say? How can staff describe what does staff do to actually make that process happen, especially in the food service, around food services? How do you write your menu? How do you bring your meal, meal services out? What do you do to actually demonstrate that you can provide choice? How can, how can that actually be described as well? And I suppose, yes, the evidence that can make that happen. Thanks, Esther. Okay, so here we go. Here's our first poll question. So if you'd like to get out your mobile phones and type in on your search engine, www.mentimeter.com. So in the blue there, type that in. We're going to go to, Esther's going to click out of this. We're going to go to a slide that's going to show a code. And that code is, I'll read it to you. It's 34246467. If you type that code in, and then you, the, what that will do is prime all the rest of the polls for this session. And if you put that into your phone, you can then choose, the question is, how many hot lunch choices can residents choose for the lunch meal? So I'll just give you a little bit of time to get onto the Mentimeter. We're actually loading the code, which is 34, 24, 647. And then how many hot lunch choices can residents choose for the lunch meal and as you can see I love this this is just such a swish thing to do <laughs> you can see that actually we're starting to get some more and more people actually filling that in which is fantastic so really basically how many hot lunch choices do you serve at lunch from your menu can I just uh, while everyone's doing that just remind everybody we've got seem to have someone that's not on mute if so just make sure you're all muted that'd be great okay I'll just give you a little bit extra time because this is the first one. The next one won't take as long because you'll all be all clued in. <laughs> but isn't this interesting? I mean, look at that, okay. So we've got a couple of aged care homes that have one choice. Seems to be two, seems to be the predominant. We've got a couple that, uh, couple that do three and also a couple that do four or more, which is excellent, okay. So again, 
really interactive that shows basically how you can you know find out what's happening in people's food services so esther we might move on from there you can give us the next slide There you go. Excellent. So we've done, I did a little bit of research for my PhD. And from that, again, the most common answers to that previous question was one or two choices for lunch. And I think this is where we're really starting to see how menus are shifting and changing in which aged care homes are now trying to put in extra choice for residents to choose for their lunch or even across the menu. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be for lunch. It could also be for the evening meal as well. Fantastic. So again, this table here just really demonstrates the fact that hot breakfasts was usually one choice. As you can see lunch, it was one or two choices. And the same for the hot entree, the evening meal, it was actually one or two choices as well. Again, I can tell you auditing lots of menus, and I've done a couple lately where people have actually had soup on for lunch and for dinner. People are really trying to look at very different menu patterns to actually, I suppose, meet the needs and the expectations of residents. Thanks, Esther. Next slide. Okay, so what does choice mean? It's really simple. It's the choice between two or more possibilities. There's some other words you can use around this. It can be an election, it can be options, it could be preferences, it could be an alternative, it could be selection. But generally all the words always mean the act or opportunity of choosing or the thing to choose. Okay, so again, that's what choice is. You know, you could either want, you might have a choice between dark or milk chocolate. You might have a choice between vanilla ice cream and chocolate ice cream. That's what it is. And it's being able to present choices to people so that they have the ability to be able to make one. And that's what choice is all about. Thanks, Esther. Okay, so back to our Mentimeter. Excellent, now you all need to make a choice. So here's some really delicious looking meals. You can choose the, <laughs> the chocolate cupcakes with lovely chocolate buttercream sprinkles. You can have the waffles with ice cream. You can have the pad thai. You'd have the pizza. You can have the fish and chips and you can have the cheesecake. Okay, so what do we all got? Wow, it's really interesting to watch, isn't it? Okay, just give everyone like a couple more, half, half a minute just to see. Oh, poor cupcakes are not well liked. <laughs> no one's choosing the cupcakes. Oh, how interesting is this? How interesting. Okay, a few more people coming in. Oh, it looks like the pad thai seems to be the winner. People are obviously, now that could be for a number of reasons because it's, uh, well, people should have probably had lunch by now. Cheesecake's popular. And then dead heat for the ice cream, the pizza and the fish and chips, which is fantastic. Oh, a few more cheesecakes. Okay, great. Let's go. We're going to talk about how you all made that choice. So when Esther's ready, we'll click off that and we'll actually, and for those who are joining us, if you want to go on to Mentimeter, you can just, for those who've just joined us, just go to www.mentimeter.com and we'll put the next code up for the next one. Okay, so why is choice important? Okay, well, very simply, you will eat what, on, what is ever on your plate if you actually make the choice, which is really important. And this leads to a very positive eating experience and we want all our residents to have positive eating experiences. And it makes people feel empowered, which is really equally as important. And it makes the food service exciting and very engaging. Okay, so we want our residents to be enjoying the food services that they have at their homes. And we all like to have choice. Who does not like the idea of having choice? And of course, it gives us power. And how many times have we all heard that really food is one of the last things that people in res residential aged care homes get to choose from, which is really important. It also makes residents feel respected. It's very personal as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about food memory in a couple of slides down the track and also for cultural and religious purposes as well people might like to have additional choice but the crux of the matter is everybody likes to choose what they want to eat and we have scientifically data has shown that people tend to eat more 
So if you've got small eaters, by giving them choice, you may find they actually could eat more. And when you're thinking about things like malnutrition in aged care, then giving people more choice may actually mean they'll eat more and that actually may, you know, obviously reduce that as well. But the whole thing is choice is important because we all like it, which is important. Next slide. So but how do we choose? Well, there's a couple of areas. First, we have biological determinants, such as if you're hungry, appetite, taste, okay, so we have those. Economic determinants, such as cost, income and availability. Physical, access, education, skills. I mean, if you don't know how to cook a souffle, you're not gonna be eating souffles. So that's actually important. And then social determinants, such as culture, family, peers, meal patterns, for example. Okay, so again, as people move into aged care homes, some of those things actually do lessen out and they may not have you know, things that they need to worry about, but the meal patterns may change and so therefore that will affect the way in which people choose. Because most aged care homes are operating on some menus and that automatically actually reduces the amount of choice. People don't necessarily have the access to go to fridges, do all the things we would do at home when you're at home or in your home. So again, those are the chief um, determinants of how we actually choose food. Thanks, Esther. Now, there are also some personal factors, like likes and dislikes, like what are your favorite foods? Food preferences, big one. So how do you like your toast cooked? That's actually a food preference. So if you like it black, or do you want it nice and golden brown like I do, and I don't like my toast hot, I like my toast cold. So again, there are all sorts of food preferences. There could be the food habit, like you need to have four coffees Sorry, that's all right. You have four teaspoons of sugar in your coffee, or you might have, you know, four teaspoons of sugar on your, you know, porridge in the morning. That's and you do that habitually. That's all about food habits. Food memory. Now, food memory is actually really important, and this may explain why sometimes people in dementia really struggle. We all have a food memory. It's built over our lifetime, and that food memory actually instills in us what actually things taste like. So if you can think of your favourite food right here and right now, and you think about it, what it tastes like. So the reason why you might have chosen what you chose from those six photos was because you may have remembered what the pad thai tastes like. And so therefore you go, oh, pad thai, oh yeah, it tastes really good. And that's why you actually choose it. And we have events throughout our life. If your mother or your parents or your grandparents had the favourite fruitcake you went to for every Christmas, that's a food memory that you would keep. If you do something special all the time with events, with family or even friends or real community, that actually builds food menu memories as well. And food memories can also be built when people come into aged care homes as well. It does take a little while, but it actually can happen. And that's why it's really key when you cook from your menu that meals consistently taste the same. And the reason why they should, like for example, bread and butter pudding always tasting like the same sort of bread and butter pudding, that actually builds up food memory, which is really important. The other thing that we find about personal factors is we all eat with our eyes. So how foods look are really important as well. And of course, what happens when we have our texture mods, the texture sometimes doesn't look the same as it does because it's a puree texture, for example, and that then people lose that eat with your eye kind of concept in terms of you know stimulating their appetite and meal choice as well. And also comes back to convenience and things like cooking skills. As I said, you know I don't come home and if I don't know how to cook a souffle, I'm not gonna be able to make a souffle. Or the fact that basically you might, you know, be don't have a great lot of skills, and therefore you're not going to have an elaborate array of different types of meals, unless you do things like buy things from the supermarket and take it home and heat it up. Thanks, Esther. Now the impacts of choice are huge. So it's just not you. You're not in a little tiny bubble. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the middle last. So let's talk about the outside first. And basically, political, cultural, economic influences are huge. Remember we had that big, we had that really big cyclone that took out all the bananas in Queensland. And I remember living in New, northern New South Wales and Nambucca Heads, and we had hardly any bananas. So we had we had an uproar from our residents because there was no bananas. So basically, it was like an environmental kind of thing happened. And then we had no bananas. So that actually affected what we could put on our menu. And that actually affected what people were actually able to choose in terms of fruit. So again, so you can have environmental factors, you can have political, you can have socio, social um, like environments as well. For example, meal times, food presentation, lifestyles, things like food advertising can affect what you're gonna choose, your access, okay? And as we all know, as, as aged care residents come into homes, their access to food does actually decrease substantially. Then you've finally got things like in the middle. So what the individual think, their feelings, their knowledge, their attitudes, and their behavior. So again, we've got all these things. So it's a really big 
big, as hugely things can impact upon what people can actually choose, what they think about, what they would like to eat, how that affects their preferences. And it just is a huge system that we have to sometimes think about. And we all, we all don't consciously think about this as we choose foods. What we do is we actually, from our lifetime experiences, really shape what we would like to eat. And so when residents come into aged care homes and they have bread and butter pudding, as an example, they may not like it the first time because it wasn't made the way it was at home. So it doesn't match their taste profile of what they think or their food memory. But that can actually change. And sometimes that's why residents coming into aged care homes are very little unsettled for a couple of weeks. But generally what happens as they, they work through a menu and taste different things, they get used to the new flavours and they can build a new food menu. People in dementia, though, are a little bit different. They may not have a really good, firstly, they may not even remember food or remember how to eat. Um, but, you know, again, there could be that disruption because they look at something and they can recognise it, but they don't remember what it tastes like or, you know, it's a bit foreign to them. So, again, how people choose food and associate and work with food can be very, very different to us all. Thanks, Esther. So how much choice do we need? Well, that's a good question. So at the university, we're actually looking at this. We've got a couple of projects going on to actually ask that question. Sometimes, you know, we... Residents may not need as much choice as what we think they do. I mean, we really don't know what the answer is. And I think every home can be very different. Also, as people age, I think sometimes they get very tired and they may not want to have a lot of choice. I think really the thing is to aim for would be some very simple strategies, put in some options that basically people can, um, you know, rely upon and options that, are, that allow residents to have something if they're not happy with the menu and they can get something then and there. I think is really probably the most important thing. So again, it's really in interesting to see what that actually looks like. And as I said, we are doing a little bit of research in this space to sort of see, well, what does that really mean for our residents in aged care? Thanks, Esther. So also when we think about how much choice you can offer on a menu, we've got to look at some of the food service factors as well that can reduce choice. So you've got to make sure you've got your procurement storages. You've got to have enough storage space if you want to bring in piles of slabs of frozen cakes and slices and things, then you've got to make sure you've got enough freezer space. You've got to have a production system that can actually deal with it, a meal delivery system that can take it, a food safety program that's altered to actually make sure it all fits in. You've got to have staffing. You need to also make sure when does that choice occur? So when do people ask the choices around meal times? What does that look like in aged care homes? Um, basically, you know, you have the will of the organisation even to want to bring in choice as well, because sometimes it can be a bit complex and it may mean staff may have to hover around, ask, you know, residents more questions about what they would like to eat, offer it at like mid-meal snacks, for example, that might chop a little bit of extra time. But again, you know, it, one, it's a very worthwhile thing to think about. And then, as I said, the last slide, what is the residence level of choice, which is actually required? And some place homes might be very happy to have one hot choice at lunchtime because that's what the residents would like. And other homes, completely different expectations. Thanks, Esther. So I'm going to talk about now some very quick strategies. So I've kind of, I'm, I'm developing my own choice strategy menu language, I think, for planning meals. So I thought about this and I went, okay, I reckon you can have decoration variety, garnishing variety, same category variety, meal extension variety, food variety, and side menu variety. So these are very simple strategies which you can implement immediately. Now I'm gonna say one thing, and I think the greatest thing every aged care home can do is actually stop. And if you wanna integrate some of these strategies, that's fantastic. But I think the most simple thing every aged care home can do is actually stop and actually ask residents. That is by far the most quickest thing. So if you're doing morning or afternoon tea runs and you've got something, instead of just giving out a biscuit, maybe asking what kind of biscuit residents would like to have. And again, I will clarify that it does depend on your um, menu ordering system in terms of maybe the larger meals. But I think there's a lot of things we can do in our mid-meal snack area that really can make a big difference to our residents. Thanks, Esther. Okay, so let's talk about decoration variety. Now, yeah, I, must think, I don't have a thing with cupcakes, but I, these, these are, this is a really quick example. And you can actually do this anywhere to any food that you want to do. So basically we have uh, cupcakes and you can have one recipe and you can just do all sorts of wonderful things to cupcakes. So pre-purchase different buttercreams for different colours or buy little colouring palettes and, and change the buttercream over. Get out a piping bag, use chocolate sprinkles. Man, I was in the supermarket the other day and I had a look at all the sprinkles that you could buy. I mean, there's so many things you can do to cupcakes. You can get out pipe, piping techniques, which is the metal 
photo or the bottom photo. You can even like change the paper cases around. Okay, you can use examples like the white plate, which actually has an array of different cupcakes that you can actually choose. So again, how simple is this? You actually go up to your residents and say, which cupcake would you like to have today? And of course, they're engaged because they get to look at all the pretty colours and the different designs and different piping, and they get to choose something that they actually like. Okay, so again, very, very simple. So that's what I call decoration variety. Next one, Esther. So this is simple choice strategies, same food garnishing variety. So again, garnishing is actually a really, really easy thing to do. And you can garnish, like even for example, let's just take a soup, for example, which is a really easy one to explain. You can put croutons, grated cheese. You can have like finely chopped up, very well washed parsley. You could use sour cream, you can use cream. And again, it's just a simple thing of asking the residents, would you like to have something extra on top of your soups? A little bit hard to do if you're on a tray meal service, unless you pre-ask the resident. Uh, a little bit easier probably to do in a dining room. And that is a very engaging strategy. You can have someone going around just asking. I'm not saying you have to have every single one of these strategies going at the same time. It could be just something you mix up really differently from time to time. And again, you can add different breads to this, have a different bread roll, do all sorts of things in that space. But again, it's not hard to actually just change things around a little bit to, you know, garnish and, you know, make a difference. And that's, again, a very simple way of improving choice. Next slide. Thanks, Esther. Now this is by far one of the most easiest, and I sometimes think since aged care uses biscuits by the tonne loads, and I've often thought I should have had cheese and arnets, but anyway, you can have simple choice strategies using category of biscuits. Now I have actually been in a lot of aged care homes where I've watched people do things like morning and afternoon team runs, and they just give a resident a biscuit. Take a biscuit in, the residents could be in their rooms. Okay, so again, very simple. Ask the resident what they would like. You can do that tray of biscuits on the right. That basically, as you can see, there's many different types of biscuits. You can just get this assorted cream biscuits and just ask the resident what kind of biscuit they would like to have. You can actually use shape cutters and you can actually make the same biscuit recipe and just cut them into different shapes and ask the resident which one they would like to have. So again, low cost, easy to do. You can start this tomorrow. Um, and basically, you just display to the resident what their choices are. And I will acknowledge the fact it may take a little bit of extra time to serve. I don't mean, it probably would, but that's an extra bit of service which would be so warranted in terms of empowering residents to engage with the food supply. So again, simple strategies using biscuits. Thanks, Esther. Again, simple strategies, category variety using slices. Now, look, there are so many pre-made slices on the market. You can have an array of these that are your residents' top favourites and you can always cut up pieces and if, for example, you've got these sorts of products available which are in slabs and it's just like you might run out, you can always go back, very much like biscuits, you can always go back and open up another packet and make sure the resident gets the kind of biscuit they actually like to have or the slice. So again, simple strategy. Thanks, Esther. Now, simple choices. This is what I call meal extensions. So, you know, I've been in a lot of aged care homes overseas and I've seen everything from serving out like the protein portion on a plate and then basically have the array of vegetables that residents actually get to um, get to actually see and they get to choose on their table with using tongs of course but of course you can offer different dipping sources for finger foods and we've got like heaps of them it could be garlic you can have barbecue tomato gar uh, sorry sweet chili you can also do different gravy so you could have a meat and you could offer maybe a different gravy so it could be you know a mustard sauce or a pepper sauce or just the standard brown gravy or chicken gravy. So again, very simple that you can just do. And it's a matter of just asking the resident what they would like to have with their meal. And again, they will actually increase service time just a little, but it's not like it's going to extend it greatly. So again, I think these are very simple things we can do at meal times to really get residents engaging. Thanks, Rory. Thanks, Esther. And obviously, simple foods, different foods. So you've got things like suppliers who have an array of different quiches or little party pies or sausage rolls or you offer finger food plates and platters for people to choose off of course again using tongs that residents can choose from there's a photo in the middle a whole pile of different croissants that could be made so again you could use this like different foods that can be combinations to make like this would be probably a really good strategy for the evening meal so that residents actually have a choice and again even though this is, yes, ready-made kinds of foods, they're very simple and very easy for you to start immediately and ask residents what they would like to have. Thanks, Esther. Okay, so we're going to go to Mentimeter again. And if you'd like to 
pick your favorite word. So pick a word to describe what choice means to your residents or clients. I'll give you a little bit of a chance to actually type that in and we'll see what we come up with. So pick a word to describe choice and the code is 3424647 and just type in www.mentimeter.com for those who have joined us and 3424647. Okay, we've got variety. Independence, excellent. We've got personalized freedom. Okay, so how this works for those who have never seen how word clouds work, the biggest word or the one that's the biggest, which is obviously independence in blue gets, obviously that's what people are thinking that it really does mean to residents. And that's true. It's all about independence, isn't it? Which is obviously one of the hearts of the new aged care standards is trying to keep people as independent as possible. Also, we have variety there, we have satisfaction, we have personalised, which is great, individual, excellent, very good. Thanks, Esther. Thanks, everyone, that was really good. Independence wins. Everyone knows that choice is about independence, which is really good. Okay, thanks, Esther. Okay. I'd like to um, introduce Stephen Blant, who is the Food Service and Catering Manager from Pensacola Villages. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what Stefan has been doing in his uh, food services. And he's been doing some really interesting around what I call a side menu. So I'm gonna show you Stefan's menu or a slide of Stefan's menu. And I'm also gonna show you his uh, side menu. So what I might do is we might just move to the Next slide, thanks, um, Esther, just so we can see the menu that uh, Stefan has. Great. So, Stefan, can I just ask you a question? So, your can you just describe your current menu? You have uh, just describe how your current menu looks right now. So, our current menu is we have one uh, choice for the main menu. Uh, we have odd choice for breakfast every day. We have one lunch and one dinner. And uh, after that, we have a side menu. Okay. So, Esther, we might just go to the next slide. And, Stefan, can you tell me what brought about the development of your side menu? It was to be able to offer choice with a reasonable cost. With, okay, so choice with minimal cost. Yes. Now, how did you how did you decide what go what went on these menus? So just just so that everyone can see, we've got a lunch menu alternative, plus we've got a dinner alternative as well. What how did you make those decisions to get those sorts of uh, meals onto those onto your side menu? So we have a food committee with some staff, some residents, and some family member. And uh, before COVID, we were um, meeting every three months sometime every month when needed. Um, and basically it's what resident like. Uh, we also did a feed box, feedback box uh, at the reception and basically talking to the residents and see what they like, see what we can offer, see what we can supply, uh, see what is available with the supplier and see how we can go on choice. And did the menu, did you change it a lot to start with? Uh, yes, that's the second time that we have the side menu and we change every six months. Okay. Um, but it's very easy to adjust. So if, if one don't like, if someone don't like one, some one dish and many people don't like it, it's easy, easy to change example, the meatball with it, take it off and put something else. Okay, and I noticed obviously your lunch menu side menu is a bit more comprehensive than your dinner alternate menu. Uh, yeah, that was to start for the lunch, but now we're doing uh, lunch and dinner the same. So basically whatever they want, uh, once they want, if we can supply, we will do it. Okay, and how often, like, I mean, I suppose the question is, and I think everyone would like to know, when does the resident have to order 
the alternate lunch and the alternate dinner menu? When does that occur? At breakfast time. So every morning okay. I got my stuff uh, going on with a tablet, with iPad. And we're using the system called Sample. And they're asking what they feel like. And at the start, it was very difficult when people was changing their mind. For example, at dinner time, or oh, I changed my mind, I want something else. The staff was saying, no, 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 that's what you order. So uh, now we really try to break the mentality and ask the staff, no, if they change their mind, they change their mind. Like just go in the kitchen and do whatever they need. Because most of these options are frozen, aren't they? Yes. And that allows you to, the flexibility. So if you say the resident wanted, say, the chicken dim sims for the lunch menu, and then they say, oh, no, no, hang on a tick, tick, I want the chicken tenders. You can actually, you haven't taken out the chicken dim sims. You can just, you can change that quickly, can't you? Because you can just swap one in and swap one out. Is that right? Uh, no, because the chicken dim sim will be already cooked. So it's just waste. Oh, okay. Someone, someone okay. else can have it. But it's very easy to make the chicken tender. Oh, okay, okay, fair enough. Oh, great, okay. So what you do then is you obviously, if someone doesn't want something, you can then open that option up for another resident. Yes. Cool, nice. And what's the satisfaction like around this? Uh, I will say at the moment uh, is uh, probably around 95%. Uh, at the moment, they uh, start to get cranky because we got some COVID procedure in place, so they cannot come everybody in the dining room. Um, but uh, uh, next week I got another committee meeting to for the next morning. Oh, okay. And, and when I go, I want to see people. They're pretty happy with the food, so uh, we got a good chef. Um, if we if they don't like meal, we quickly act and quickly uh, change the meal. Uh, so it's never twice a bad meal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's always helpful, isn't it, to make sure all the residents, you know, are keeping pen and paper away from a complaint form, isn't it? Oh, no, because it's okay. It's like, uh, any feedback for me is a good feedback, so uh, we're really trying to do our best for them. Okay. Okay. And can I just ask you, what do people think about the nutrition content of, of what these alternatives are? Bearing in mind a lot of them are actually frozen. Do have you had any comments about the fact that people don't think there is nutrition nor nutritional as say like a, a fresh cooked meal? Uh, no, I will say more is more for me. My feedback, I think frozen food uh, sometimes is just quick industrial food with a minimum stuff inside. Okay. But resident, resident don't really mind and don't really look the nutrition. You know, you give them the chips every day, they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is true. Did you say if you give them chips every day, they're happy? Yeah, they were, yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't actually have chips on here with a, with a, you could have chips on here with a, a number of sauces and things so they can make choice with the sauce and have chips. <laughs> well, no, I was at your age care yeah. home. Sorry, sorry Stefan. So, sorry, I was going to say, you go. I say it was a good idea, the chips on the menu. Uh, it's a good idea. Yeah. I'm going to actually talk about why I think that's actually a good idea. I've got another slide to show after this one. Um, but look, if you, anyone's got, um, thank you, Stefan, that was really interesting. I, I find this concept to be really so simple to implement in terms of giving residents an instantaneous choice to their menus is just these side menus. Um, I was having a chat to another colleague uh, yesterday and we were talking about how we could even develop skeletal menus. They can actually change the rotation of menus really quickly. So I think there's lots of ways in which you can plan menus that um, can offer choice without having to, I think, go whole hog and even like highly expensive ways of actually doing it. So thanks, Stefan. That was really, really insightful. And thank you for sharing your side menus with us. And if anyone's got any questions for uh, Stefan, just put them in the chat function and we'll actually try to get, we'll get to those at the end. So Esther, can I have the next slide? So this is the other example I was talking about. Now this is only for lunch, but I mean, I think if you can do anything for any meal, it's going to be a winner. I think anytime you can add choice to the, either your menu pattern or during the day, I think is really, tick that box, a really good thing to do. And as you can see by this menu, 
they actually have obviously a cook chill or maybe a cook freeze process in place and they've actually got things like all of roast meats so if the resident isn't happy with how the uh what the meat of the day is they can actually get something else which is fine and they can use the same vegetables but again it also has some of those quick options as well in which you can have things like you know macaroni cheese and they also offer a array of desserts so if people aren't happy with the dessert they can click out and get things like ice cream and yogurt they can have stewed fruits they can have wonderful cheesecake you know, other sorts of cakes and jelly and pavlova so again just another idea about how you might be able to set up a side menu and again it really comes back to what Stefan said which is really important is to discuss those things with your um, residents and get the feedback to see what would be the best options to make sure that they're um, going you know they're happy with the menu Esther can I have the next slide thanks now I want to talk about uh, just quickly about nutrition and sometimes to set up these menus you're going to have to take a few shortcuts and those shortcuts are going to be things like use ready-made meals they could be frozen they could be frozen in pardons they could be things like schnitzels it could be chicken tenders it could be all sorts of things that are frozen or ready to go and you have to actually think about those sorts of cooking and food strategies if you're going to uh, be able to pull off something like a side menu because don't forget when you get to the dining room service and the resident wants something a little bit different even if you may have had the order you may if you have to change that you've got to be able to pull those strategies out of your cold room or out of your freezer so I want to talk about this notion that sometimes ready-made meals are not as nutritious now what is the goal of aged care food services now you're not saving anybody to start with but what you want to do is you want to have people with a high quality of life as much as possible so you want to make sure they're enjoying the meals we have our elderly as they well, as people get older and they get frailer they tend to eat less and they have lots of other issues with the body that as the body ages and so you've got to be mindful of the fact that basically you've got um you've got to take care of that and so sometimes the option for in aged care should be about making sure they eat their meal not necessarily about how nutrition it is now let me clarify that it's important that we all eat nutrients every day but you can probably get enough nutrients from other meals if you have a good well-designed menu and then allow residents to maybe go off and have some things that may not be considered the most nourishing on the planet but is something that the resident will actually eat so let's take an example of the party pies there was a bit of an uproar about that a couple of years ago party pies residents getting party pies well you know <laughs> they're not a bad thing to have i mean i'm not saying you should have them all the time but they're easy to eat they're small they're not overwhelming and basically they can be really easily heated up really quickly now, if some, if for example, a resident wanted party pies every single night, now one could say, would that be an issue? Well, no, you'd get the dietitian in, and what would happen is the dietitian would do a nutrition review and make sure there was enough stuff during the day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, maybe mid, mid meal snacks as well, to actually compensate for the fact if a resident wanted a particular kind of fast food, ready made meal option all the time. The thrill trick is the fact we want people to eat, and if people want to have something, it's maybe not considered to be the most nourishing thing. And I have had many discussions with directors of care and management of homes to say it's actually not your menu. So I get a lot of comments when people say, oh, I wouldn't put that on the menu. I wouldn't eat that at home. Well, that's great. You don't eat it at home, but the residents actually might like to eat it. So again, there's nothing wrong with using some technology and food technology to actually help supplement your menu if it means the residents are actually going to eat more and get choice, which I've, as I've explained during this session, can lead to increased food intake. So as I said, meals may not be ideal from your perspective. Now we have actually got some research undergoing about what fresh is. We talked a little bit about it at the beginning, um, but basically, you know, this idea that everyone's got such wonderful fresh menus, we could probably debate, but it's about the concept of what actually residents are eating. And it's also you got to take into consideration that you could have 70 residents in your um, aged care home. And don't forget those 70 residents are going to have 70 food habits, 70 preferences, 70 likes, 70 dislikes. They could have all those sorts of parameters, which means you have every single meal service. You've got about 280 different kinds of food behaviors. You've actually got to think about every single meal. So I think food services is really hard. It's really hard to make sure everybody's happy. But I think the main goal should be to actually try and get residents to eat and eat something every single meal and not to miss an occasional nutrition because they didn't like something. And I think the side menus are really clever because basically it means that if Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith hasn't had a lot to eat that meal, offering her something is going to be a good solution, okay, because they're frailer, they don't have sometimes the fat reserves that we actually have um, and they do need to constantly eat um, all the time to maintain good nutrition. So it can be tricky. 
a very, very tricky thing looking after people in their food and their meals because they're all very complex individuals. And as we've talked about today, choice can be tricky, complicated, and comes from a very strong behavioural premises around every single resident. Thanks, Esther. Okay, going to Minty, here we go. So here's a good question. So what percentage of your menu is made up of ready-made foods or meals? So we'll go to the poll and we'll see what everyone says. So you can have less than 20, could be 100%, more than 80. Let's see what happens. So here's our scale. So how much ready-made foods are used to plan menus? And we'll see what everybody says. Wow. So we get people coming in. And this is really interesting because, I mean, I'll give you an example while we're just waiting for people to put their results in. People would say that frozen vegetables are actually a fresh food. The reality is they're actually not. <laughs> they come from more the ready-made meal area because all you have to do is open them and heat them and serve. So, again, it's really interesting to see how everyone thinks about food. And that's why we're doing some research at the University of Queensland. One of my PhD students is doing that to actually see what this word fresh actually means and what percentage of aged care home menu planning is actually around that in itself which is interesting so okay we've got some results and we can see here that we've got okay so 3.6 so that's about 36 percent of um is 3.6 so about yeah so about 30 percent uh, of aged care menus which is actually the, roughly the mean um is what people think that they've got ready-made meal foods which is great so thanks everybody thanks esther we'll move on to the next slide I love this minty meter, I think it's great. Okay, so I'd like to introduce to you to David. David is from Vesco Foods, and we're gonna have a little bit of chat about this ready-made meal food space and gives people some ideas um, in terms of what that actually looks like. So David's come on board, there he is, I can see him. So yes, we might just go to the next slide. And can I just ask, uh, everyone hopefully is on, yeah, cool. So David, basically, what constitutes a ready-made meal? Yes, I think like you've sort of touched on ready-made meals, they sort of do come in lots of different shapes and sizes and formats and so forth. It could be from a a schnitzel potentially through to you know a tray of lasagna um, and even like you've said, you know, even um, you know, a curry or you know, just something that gives you that opportunity to not have to to make something from yourself. It's it's ready ready to go. Now you now, so so within your food, so you guys predominantly look at, you're probably a little bit more of the finished, aren't you? You look at the things where you've got the lasagnas, the larger size um, lasagna packs, and also the smaller individual meals, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So we do, so we do a, a quite a large range of individual um, fully finished meals um, that could be used, you know, as a, like as a, a full service, or you've got the option of, a main meal that you could then supplement with a side dish. So be that a tray of lasagna where you put your salad with it or or um or so forth. And what do you find aged care homes like to use? Yeah, so we sell a lot of lasagnas uh, into the aged care market. Um, so the beef lasagna and also our vegetable lasagna, um, that'd be our two popular products through the market. Okay. Esther, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so let's talk about this. So what are some of the features, David, that you think really, I suppose, ready-made meals could be used to help bring choice to aged care, dining and menu planning? Yes, I think the the, great, the, the big points I suppose to talk about with, with ready-made meals is that um, not only are they convenient from um, a operational perspective but like where we looked at the different menu options it, it gives you that ability to have that side menu so where you can then make your, one dish yourself and then have that choice available for your residents um, the other real key advantage to it is that it is a fixed for quite it's very easy to be able to a portion out a tray of lasagna and work out exactly what your cost is going to be but then also be able to determine what the nutritional value and although when we talk about choice nutritional value like you're saying isn't necessarily the forefront but it's obviously important so if you can then look at the product and be able to ascertain okay this is the value i'm going to get from this product it'll it'll make it a lot easier for you 
Um, so you can give you your resident choice and also tick the other boxes that you need to do at the same time. And I, th I think you're quite right what you've pointed out. It's actually, I think the ready-made meal market's got a little bit of a, I suppose, a stigma around it in terms of people don't think it's naturally as nutritional as something that you might make from fresh. But I think it's as you're, you, what you point out is correct. It actually it's that convenience, isn't it? It's actually if you can, if you haven't, if, if you're not giving choice right now, and you can actually give choice by using methods such as this, that would actually would probably score a lot of good brownie points with residents if they can improve improve choices, which means naturally they might eat more anyway, which would be obviously a good thing and a good outcome. Yeah, do you think absolutely. that? Um, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, do you think that? Um, what about like? How much time do you think they save people when they like you know if you've got those sorts of ready-made meal options available? Yeah, well, I think I think what it poses a great value proposition to um, to the residential home and to your operation is that if you don't have skilled labour, so when you look at time saving, not only does it, is it a time saver, uh, like obviously having to just to reheat the product, but it also gives you an opportunity if your say your chef is on for you know eight hours of the day and then you've got your non-skilled labor that are finishing off the, the service at night um it's an easy option for them it's you know there's there's not there's not a lot of complexity to reheating and serving a ready-made meal um so you do take a lot of that guesswork out of it um and i think to your point around, around that fresh and frozen piece where when we manufacture our products you know, we, we make it and we freeze it straight away so when you've got um product in the kitchen Although you may be making it from fresh, it's it's not necessarily better than a frozen option because that ingredient may have been sitting there for a while, or you've made it, it's been sitting out for a while before you've actually got to serve it. So it's a little bit of a misconception, I think, between that fresh and frozen piece as well. Um, and I think in some cases, frozen can can be better because it's that frozen straight away. Well, that's quite correct. We can think about frozen vegetables sometimes, you know, sometimes you've got the, you know, the carrots hanging around for a long time, maybe more nourishing or have higher nutrition when they're frozen than they are actually when they're being fresh. And that's actually quite true for how long sometimes carrots have to travel across the country or fresh fruit has to, or fresh vegetables have to travel across the country. Esther, can we have the next slide? But what about, I mean, I've had some interesting stories during this unfortunate COVID period where people have used uh, aged care homes have used ready-made meals actually as a, I suppose, precaution just in case um, everyone got sick and they had options then to be able to uh, feed their residents, which I think, I mean, I didn't even think of that until someone actually told me and I went, of course, that actually would be a very sensible thing to have in terms of a backup food supply. Have you heard much oh, about that? Yeah, absolutely. We we had a, a massive influx um, at, the be at the beginning of COVID um, for orders and so forth where people were using our range as their contingency plan, um, absolutely. And it, being that it's a frozen product, it's got a very long shelf life. So you've got the ability to be able to keep it on hand. And then if, for instance, your kitchen does go down or your, your uh, facility goes into lockdown, um, then you're able to easily still provide a meal service to your residents. Excellent. And Dave, we're just looking at the last slide here is obviously the range. And you said lasagna was your number one popular yeah, absolutely. Selling item, yeah. was that correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, David. And if you want to ask any questions to David, he's staying online as well. So please just put those into the chat option, and we'll um, obviously, as we get to the end of this presentation, we'll open up the questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. Next slide, please. Thanks. thanks okay. So just to let everyone know, we're developing. We're going to probably call it a bit of a resource hub, a library, but we're going to. Um, as we move through all our webinars, we're going to be developing up resources. So if you weren't on last session, last month, we've actually, I made up a checklist on uh, standard 43F, which is going through the entire standard to actually say, what kind of evidence do you need? It was a very loose document, but it basically gave people the ideas that you could use this to see how that particular standard went. I've also done the same thing for this um, session where I've actually made up specifically around choice to see how you can measure, how you show, demonstrate, explain, how you do choice. And I think it's just, these things are just great to have as backups, maybe something to run just to see how you're going and making sure that you know, you're ready for when you get your accreditation visits or unannounced visits. And the other thing we've done today is on the website right now, we have a, a, nutri um, a bit of an education article that I wrote using looking at ready-made meals providing choice. And what we did was we asked all our supplier partners if they would like to get involved 
and we've got some links there that show you all the sorts of products that you can get from our supply partners that can help you and they can be very much like what David talked about the big bulk meals or they could be like things like finger foods as well so we've gone through and we've actually tried to you know make that really easy and of course um, big food is our supply partner for distribution so of course we've all got the big food codes ready to go so again so we are going to be building um, this resource hub for everybody or library every time we do a presentation so look out for that and we'll move on to the next slide thanks Esther. And for all those who don't know, I'm actually a supply partner as well for Church Resources. So I have a range of services. That looks like a very complicated slide, but I'll break it down really quick for you. So we have lots of uh, services that actually help aged care homes and dining room spaces. We can do things like in-service programs so we can help educate your staff. We can come up with packages so you can get a couple of those every year. I do lots of menu reviewing, as I said before, lots of support, lots of consultancy. Also, for everyone who'd like to, if you want to go to the website, nutcatit.com.au, you can join my newsletter for free. So I have this massive food service um, newsletter that I send out. It's got all sorts of stuff. And the last thing that I've added to my little repertoire is I've actually got my own research institute called the Nutrition and Catering Institute. And I am very serious about trying to sort, solve and fix and do all sorts of things in the area of food services especially in the residential aged care sector. So we're looking at preventing and control of chronic disease, looking at how we can reduce malnutrition. So we're always looking, we want to translate science, we want to lift up all food services. So that, you know, I really value food services. I might be a dietitian, but I think food services are my people. So we really, really want to um, help in that space. So there's my services and you're more than welcome to give me a call anytime to have a discussion. So can I have the next slide, thanks Esther. Now I'd like to hand over to Ian Birrell, who's going to just riff, quickly go through some of the church resources. Again, we have loads of things to actually support all our members. Thanks, Ian. Thank you very much, Dr. Karen. And good afternoon, everyone. And uh, hopefully, uh, welcome to the webinar, and I'm sure you're enjoying it. Um, for those of you who weren't with us uh, last month, uh, really just given uh, an overview of what we do at Church Resources. I, I'm the uh, category manager for the food service solutions for all our members. Um, and really well supported by our key partners. But we aggregate for all sectors, so whether it's aged care, education, welfare, uh, health, or, or the church sectors. Um, we, we accommodate and look after all those sectors. And we specialized in the not-for-profit sector for many, many years, over 20 years. So we have really solid experience in, in this particular sector. And we certainly got um, a really good base of supply partners who have a really good understanding of, um, of the not-for-profit sector and its particular needs. Um, we're an enabler, a trusted advisor. So by that, um, I mean that we are always looking for what's in the best interest of our members. Um, it's very much about finding the right choice for our member and really putting a proposals in front of them and, and choice in front of them, um, which is important so that they, uh, choose the, the particular path that's that's relevant to their particular location and site and, and their, their needs. So uh, we this allows the members, procurement staff, uh, to use us as a resource with an additional resource that they don't have to pay for. Um, and it enables them to really get on with their day-to-day -day operations. And um, our expertise is backed up by our uh, approximately $40 million annual spend that uh, our members ha have under us. And that brings with it, obviously, a whole host of uh, additional value adds that we can we can bring to our member base. So we use the 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 spend and the volumes that our members provide to uh, enable us to negotiate really good value adds and pricing, very, very competitive pricing from our supply partners. Um, and it ensures that everyone can access uh, the the best price possible. Uh, irrespective of the state they're in or the uh, the size of their particular organization. And uh, we we partnered historically with Australia's leading and recognized companies. Bid Foods, our distribution partner. We have Goodman Fielder for a uh, bread partner, Lion and uh, food service for uh, dairy and milk and m and chicken, and then for the poultry. And then along that, we have other additional um, consultancy partners as well as equipment partners. So we're really making sure that the partners we associate ourselves with, that the members will not just recognize them, but it's quality and a really good experience. Um, we also do provide, one of the services we provide for our members is an analysis of where they are currently. So it's quite often 
quite a time consuming exercise to go through and, and work out how does my, my current agreement sit? How does my current supply um, agreements with our, with our partners and suppliers uh, stack up against the market? Are they competitive from a price point of view? Are the services provided where they should be? And we, we certainly provide a service to our members where we'll do a comparison against what we have uh, in place against what they have uh, in their own individual location. So again, it's just a service that we can provide to our members to take, to take up that uh, task that would normally take a lot of time and come back and give them a, a, a view on how it sits. And our, our, our purpose is to come back and just give an indication of the lay of the land and then it's up to the member to decide which direction they wish to take. Um, next slide, please, Esther. Thank you. Um, from the point of view of uh, members in regards to the food service program, um, all our members who are under us belong to our Excellence in Food Service program automatically. It means that uh, they get access to webinars as such as we've got now. Um, they get access to Dr. Karen for particular conversations, discussions about how they're going. Um, we have a HACCP certificate program whereby we hold all the current HACCP certifications um, in a, a system, um, at the uh, a very simple system with Xerite. So members can access that for easily for audits um, or they can email myself and it can be provided and turnaround is really quick. So um, there's a number of educational events we provide. We do, as I've mentioned already, the benchmarking exercise. We send out blogs and information from our supply partners on new products, on uh, different information education that uh, they're certainly participating in. So there really is good advantages about being under church resources. Um, and the most important aspect of uh, membership is it's free. So from a membership point of view, there's no, there's no membership fee to participate in. You can access our services at any time. And we have a really good um, team of relationship managers in each state that look after our members, not just for food service, but across all the different categories and channels that uh, Church Resources and Procurement Australia provide to our members. So it's easy to um, to hear and learn about them. And certainly if you're interested, by all means do both my email addresses at the end and Dr. Karen's and you know, just shoot me a, an email and I'll certainly put you in touch with the relevant relationship manager uh, in your area. But um, we encourage all our members, and I, I, I absolutely encourage all our members to just get in touch and find out what is what is out there and what is possible and how how we can further help you uh, over and above the webinars that we're doing currently. Next slide, Esther. So these are some of the website articles that we send out. These are available on the Procurement Australia website under the food service tab. And we have uh, an abundance of um, articles that are there that Dr. Karen has um, been the gatekeeper for for the last couple of years. So there's certainly a lot of information there, really short information and blogs that can be looked at. Uh, next slide, please, Esther. Along with the blogs, there's recipes that Dr. K has put together. Um, really quick and easy recipes to do. Uh, and predominantly in the aged care sector, there are some educational sector ones there too, but primarily it's in the aged care sector. And um, I have to say that whenever Dr. Karen was creating and um, putting these recipes together. Um, we were fortunate enough that every time she actually cooked them in the office. So um, I can guarantee that uh, not only do they look good, they taste wonderful as well. Next slide, please, Esther. And we have a YouTube uh, channel. It's uh, accessible under the CI Kitchen, uh, and you can go through the link from the website. But uh, again, there are some short videos there where Dr. K talks about the recipes she put together as well as uh, some of the new products from uh, some of our supply partners and uh, sort of explains uh, where, where you can get them from, how they're, how they're put together and the various ways to implement and bring in the choice to what she's created. Next slide, please, Esther. And Thanks, with that, look, just want to thank you and I'll hand you back to Dr. K. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Great. Okay, so we're now down to obviously summarising and get to the you know good end of asking questions. So just really to recap, we spent a little bit of time today looking at why choice is important, and clearly the standard, especially for three F, drives towards you know how do you demonstrate, provide, um, engage your residents to actually have food choice. Um, and I think we've also showed some really easy strategies about how 
you could easily do that. I think um, if you really just want to think about what choice means to someone, I think it would brighten up anybody's day to be uh, asked if what they would like to have. I've seen many examples where I've seen choice go out into aged care homes for the first time when I've been down there doing, or being in a consultancy and actually help residents, helping aged care homes to develop menus and develop dining room strategies for choice and also even mid-meal strategies for choice as well. And it's been lovely to watch the beaming little smiles. And I think it actually just makes the menu, or the whole food service is really fresh and different and engaging, which is important. And as I said, you know, the most simple thing to do is just to go and ask. And it can be a very simple strategy. Some other strategies that I just put down in a piece of paper was, you know, you could ask for different flavoured ice creams, like have ice cream cones. It's what flavour would you like to have in your cone today, which would be great. It could be a different ice block. It could just be about anything. It could be a different drink. It could be a different flavoured milk. It doesn't really matter what it is. As I think the real point behind choice is the fact that it actually provides that wonderful moment when people feel that they're special, they feel that they're valued, and they feel like their opinion's actually important. And I think any aged care home who can do the most simplest strategies, can do put a side menu in, can use any sort of tech, food technology to actually increase choice is going to be doing, uh, you know, we'd just be doing such a wonderful service. And I don't think you could really underestimate or undervalue what that would mean for a resident in an aged care home when they've had to give up so much to move into like their one room in their en suite and you know have to share dining rooms and have to share spaces so I think those sorts of things are actually really really important so again as I said if you could only add one choice a day if you could do one thing different in your food services I think you would be you know making your food services 100% you know getting it out there and really helping residents to actually move through. So that's where we're going to leave it for choice. I'd like to thank our guests, both Stefan and David, for um, basically coming along this afternoon. Really appreciate those industry insights. are really important. I think you've got some real good take-homes there. Now, you know, Stefan uh, has put in that menu, the side menu, really great strategy. Uh, David, thanks also for like, just giving us some concepts and ideas and features around like why those sorts of uh, technologies and the ready-made meal space is actually really important too. So we are going to send you out a survey might be today but we will send you out a survey and we would really love you to just take a little bit of time to actually fill that in um, and also as we do that we've also help you give you a link to actually for our, our resources as well and of course we have got to talk about the next event the next event is food safety we're going to do an update and also a little bit of uh, uh, information around technology and food safety as well and so just watch this space for that to happen so next slide please so a real big thanks for everyone for listening. So we're going to stay on now. We're going to open up for questions, which Ian's going to moderate. But if you want.